I used to say that Mother's Day was the day when the kids took Mother out to lunch and I paid. <laughs> but that has changed. And so the other day, one of our daughters and her husband, they, they took Mother and me too out for uh, brunch. And then this afternoon, our other daughter has invited us for supper. So it's, uh, it's quite a change. I want to read this morning from Romans chapter 5. We were in chapter 3 last Sunday, but I'd like to look at just a couple of verses in the fifth chapter of Romans, first couple of verses. I'm using a Schofield uh, reference Bible, and the heading is Results of Justification. And uh, there are three of them here in the first couple of verses. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have a new relationship. And then we have a new standing through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And then thirdly, we have a new prospect. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You'll notice he begins by referring to our having been justified by faith. We talked a little bit about this last week justify. Actually, the key words in the early chapters of Romans, I would suggest, are righteous, righteousness, justify, justification. And they're all from the same root. It doesn't look like that when we look at our English words. But uh, if instead of justify, if I were to coin an English word, righteousify, well, you would get the idea. It really is the same root to be justified is to be declared righteous. I emphasized that last week. It's not to be made righteous. We're still not right in ourselves, but we are declared right. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. And so it is that to be justified is to be reckoned right before God. This expression, the righteousness of God, was uh, one which really uh, disturbed um, Martin Luther and uh, he, uh, as far as he was concerned, in his own words, this was something which conjured up a picture of a stern judge sitting on a rainbow, waiting to hurl thunderbolts of judgment on us. The righteousness of God, it was a terrifying thought. And so the result was that he uh, was involved in all kinds of things, in penance and, uh, and uh, in good works and uh, attending mass and what have you. He was doing whatever he could in order to merit favor with this righteous God, all to no avail. And then he read these early chapters of Paul's letter to the Romans, and he discovered that we are, we are considered, we are declared right with God, not because of anything we do, not based on our merits or our achievements, but it's based on what the Lord Jesus Christ has done as we trust in him. And the result was, as he says it, that the very same words, the righteousness of God, the very same words that were to me such a terror before, became the means by which I entered the gates of paradise and came to understand what it was to be justified. Having been justified by faith, he found what he was looking for. And uh, as this verse says, he had peace with God. Now, we're not to confuse that, are we, with uh, what Paul refers to elsewhere as the peace of God. We read about that in Philippians chapter 4, where Paul talks about the peace of God shall garrison your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God is uh, freedom from, from anxiety and fear. It's a sense of well-being, a sense that all is well. It's something which... Uh, characterize the Lord Jesus. In fact, it's something the Lord could speak about. He says, my peace I, I, I give unto you, as he left his disciples. And it was something that, that was characteristic of him throughout his life and his ministry. Uh, for example, when he was in the, in the boat and uh, the storm is raging, well, he's fast asleep, oblivious to, and undisturbed by what was taking place around him. When he came into the presence of, uh, of Pilate, and uh, uh, there, was a, there was a calm serenity about the Lord Jesus. 
He stood there and uh, made no attempt to defend himself. As a sheep before her shearers is dumb, he opened not his mouth. There was, there was a peace that characterized him, recognizing that God was in control and God was working out his purpose. And so the, the Lord Jesus says to his disciples that last night, he says, peace I leave with you, my peace, my peace I give unto you. In Paul in Philippians chapter 4, he says that we can know the peace of God. It can garrison our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It's the kind of peace I think that Paul himself knew. I mean, when he wrote that letter, he's in prison in Rome, isn't he? But he's not, he's not down. He's not, he's not overwhelmed by his circumstances. There is a sense that all is well. And there is peace, recognizing that, that God was, in fact, in control. And that's a peace that we can know, the peace of God. Paul tells us in Philippians 4, uh, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God will get us in your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, the peace of God. But that's not what we have here. Peace with God. Peace with God. The peace of God is something that every Christian may enjoy, but doesn't always enjoy. In fact, I would be surprised if there is a Christian who at every moment in his life has enjoyed the peace of God. Things come in upon us. It's certainly not true of me. Things come in upon you. There are, uh, there are problems, there are issues, and uh, there are some concerns. And uh, at least for a while, the peace of God is not something that actually is, uh, is my experience. It's something which every Christian may experience, but doesn't necessarily experience all the time. Peace with God, that's something that every Christian has all the time. That is a settled state. That has got nothing to do with my state of mind. It has to do with my relationship with God through the Lord Jesus. To have peace with God is to have been brought into a new relationship with him such that uh, we might say the war is over and, uh, and we who were enemies, we've been reconciled. In fact, that's the language that Paul uses later in this chapter. He says when we get down to verse 10, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Uh, to have peace with God is to be reconciled. It means that we were, we were enemies. We were alienated from God. And, uh, and what happened? Well, God has worked in our lives, and we have, been, we have been brought near, and there is peace. Paul writes about it in Colossians chapter 1. And he uses a couple of words to describe what we were before we trusted in the Lord Jesus. And he says this, we were once alienated. Once alienated. That's what we were. And then he uses a couple of words to describe what we now are. And he says, we are now reconciled. Once alienated, now reconciled. We have peace with God. And nothing, but nothing, can change that. It's got nothing to do with my mental state. I may be all confused and mixed up and uh, there may be uh, problems. I may be worried and harassed and anxious and uh, there may be turmoil and fear and all kinds of things in my heart. Nevertheless, if I'm trusting in the Lord Jesus, I have a new relationship. I have peace with God. And one of the hymn writers, he says it better than I can. He says it this way, I hear the words of love. I gaze upon the blood. I see the mighty sacrifice. And I have peace with God. Tis everlasting peace. Sure as Jehovah's name. Tis stable as his steadfast love. Forevermore the same. The clouds may go and come. And storms may sweep my sky. This blood-sealed friendship changes not. The cross is ever nigh. My love is sometimes low. My joy still ebbs and flows. But peace with him remains the same. No change. Jehovah 
know us. We have a new relationship. We have peace with God. And then he says, secondly, that we have a new standing. In verse 2, he says, through whom also we have access. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Uh, this word access, it has the idea of um, someone being favorably disposed towards us. We are acceptable to him. And so we have the right of uh, access. We have the privilege of entry into his presence. If I can give you an example of somebody who didn't have access, uh, you may remember that um, Absalom had uh, killed his, uh, his half-brother, hadn't he? And David, uh, uh, he, as a result, Absalom has been exiled. And David, I, I think perhaps against his better judgment, uh, he's persuaded to bring Absalom back to Jerusalem. And so he does return to Jerusalem, but we read these very interesting words that he dwelt in his own house he never saw the king's face. He never saw the king's face. He had no access. He was persona non grata still. And uh, he wasn't welcome, right? And so there wasn't a restoration of that relationship. And he didn't have a standing before David at that point in his experience. Sometimes, when it comes to this idea of access, it was something which was... Um, which is, was brought about by the intervention of someone else. And so, for example, here is somebody, and uh, he's not part of the inner circle at court, uh, but there's somebody who is known there, and uh, somebody who can represent him and can arrange for him an audience for him, and so he's able to come before the king, let's say, and as a result of that, he finds himself welcome there. He has, he has, ac he has access, not something, not something that he could do on his own, but something which was uh, brought about because of someone who represented him. Well, that's what we have here. Notice what it says. Through whom also we have access. It's through the Lord Jesus. The word access is found only three times in the New Testament. And each time it is the same idea, it's the same thought. Ephesians 2.18, for through him, the Lord Jesus, we both, Jew and Gentile, have access in one spirit to the Father. And then in the same letter in the next chapter, verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. It's through him, it's through him that we have access. The Lord Jesus Christ, through him we are cleansed we're clothed in his righteousness and we have this access. We have this access into this favor or grace in which we stand. Uh, if I can illustrate it from the Old Testament again, um, you know, remember the story of, of Joseph and uh, how he treated his brothers when they came down to Egypt. Initially, when they first came, he wasn't altogether kind. Uh, he knew who they were, and uh, they didn't recognize him. And uh, after their discussion, Joseph sends them on their way, and he says, look, you better not come back unless you bring your brother, your younger brother, Benjamin, with you. No point in coming back. You will have no audience. You will have no access. And uh, when they tell Jacob about that, he wasn't thrilled. He didn't want Benjamin to go, but eventually... Reluctantly, he has to give way, and so they return to Egypt, and they bring Benjamin with him. And we read these interesting words, that when Joseph saw Benjamin, he said, bring these men home. These men will dine with me at noon, when Joseph saw Benjamin. What would have happened if Benjamin hadn't been there? Well, certainly they wouldn't have been invited to dine with him. I don't know how harsh he would have been in his treatment of them, but certainly they would have had no access. But when he saw Benjamin, then it was different. Well, that's what it amounts to. God sees my Savior, and then he sees me in the beloved, accepted and free. It's through him that we have access. Paul says it this way in Ephesians chapter 1. He says, he made us accepted in the beloved one. One of our hymns says it this way. There's a line in one of our hymns that says, we stand accepted 
in the place that none but Christ could claim. We have access. Now, it's not simply, by the way, that we have the right to approach God. Now, we do that, don't we? We've already approached the Lord this morning in prayer, and we have that right. Indeed, we are invited to come boldly to the throne of grace. We have the right of access. We have freedom to come before him, and we do that. We do that boldly, not presumptuously, uh, not carelessly, but we do it uh, humbly and reverently, recognizing that we are coming into the presence of God Almighty. He's our Father, but he is also Almighty God, and so we come carefully into his presence, but we don't hesitate to do so because we have access. We have the right to come before him. But this goes a little bit further than that. This isn't simply a case of, well, having the right to come before someone. You notice he says that uh, we have access into this grace in which we stand. This is where we are. This is not something that is uh, spasmodic. This is not something that happens once in a while. It's not an occasional thing. It's not like uh, a courtier who asks to uh, who has to ask permit who has to ask permission to come before the king. No, he doesn't, we don't have to do that. We we we, st we stand there. We stand accepted in the place that none but Christ could claim, and so we have access. We continue to stand there. We stand there all the time, confidently, with our head up high, if you will because not because we are proud, not because we've done anything in ourselves, but because of something, not because of anything we've done, but because of what the Lord Jesus has done. Through him, we have access into this grace in which we stand. And then thirdly, he says we have a new prospect. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I want to suggest that we might understand that in several ways. We might understand it, first of all, in this way. We rejoice in hope of seeing the glory of God. Now, you might say, well, we can't possibly see the glory of God. In fact, doesn't Scripture say that God dwells in inapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see? Actually, some men did see God. In the garden, for example, God came down and he walked and he talked with Adam. Presumably, in appearance as a man. But he saw God. Uh, the elders of Israel, Moses and Aaron and the elders of Israel, they went up Mount Sinai and we were told they saw the God of Israel. And they ate and drank in his presence. Presumably, in the form of a man. And at various times in the Old Testament, this happened. Abraham one day sees three men. Well, actually, none of them were men, real men. Two of them were angels, and the other one, I believe, was the second person of the Trinity. It was the Lord Jesus himself, and he saw God. He saw God. But, but on one occasion, Moses says to the Lord, um, I, want to see, I want to see your glory. And God says, you cannot see my face. No man shall see me and live. Yeah, there were occasions when God manifested himself in a way that was um, possible for individuals to look upon him. It was a limited revelation. It was something which was uh, guarded. It wasn't, uh, no one can look upon God in his essential splendor and survive. No one can possibly do that. We can't even look at the sun, can we? You try looking at the sun and immediately you, immediately you blink, you close your eyes, or you turn your head away. Well, that's true of the sun. Uh, don't you think it's true that uh, we could not possibly look upon the brilliance and the glory of God's person? If we were able somehow to do that, it wouldn't just blind us, it would consume us. We can never see God in his essential glory. He's not, it's not possible. But we rejoice in hope of seeing the glory of God. How so? Well, we will see something of the glory of God in the person of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus prays to his Father in John chapter 17, and he says, Father, this is something I desire. And he uses a very strong word there. He says, I desire that they also 
you have given me may be with me that they may behold my glory, which you gave me before the world was. We will see something of the glory of God in the person of the Lord Jesus. Fanny Crosby, she, uh, she wrote all kinds of hymns. I read that she actually wrote more than 5,000 hymns. I find that difficult to, I find that difficult to imagine, 5,000 hymns. I mean, if you write one a day, that may take you 15 years or thereabouts. Well, 5,000 hymns over a lifetime. That means she wrote one every three or four days, I guess. But anyway, that's what, it, that's what I was told. Some of them we know very well, don't we? I mean, blessed assurance, to God be the glory. I am thine, O Lord. And so there are, there are various hymns that we sing, but one of them says that when my life worth is, work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side and his smile will be the first to welcome me. Through the gates of the city, in a robe of spotless white, he will lead me where no tears will ever fall. In the glad song of ages, I shall mingle with delight, but I long to meet my Savior. First of all, I will see him. For her, that was special because she was blind. And so there was this awareness that the first person she would look upon would be the Lord Jesus. Well, we have that prospect. We see other people, of course, but, but we have this glorious prospect we rejoice in hope of seeing something of the glory of God in the person of the Lord Jesus. But we might read it another way. We might read it this way. We rejoice in hope of knowing the glory of God more fully. I already referred to Moses and to his request to the Lord, show me your glory. And, uh, and God says, well, no one can see me and live. But he says, I'll tell you what I'll do. He says, I'll cause all my goodness to pass before you. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll cover it with my hand. And then I will pass by and you will see my back parts. And uh, I will cause my goodness to pass before you. Show me your glory. I will cause my goodness to pass before you. The glory of God really, <clears throat> the glory of God really includes all of his, all of his attributes. John Piper says, that the glory of God is the infinite beauty and the greatness of God's manifold perfections. The glory of God is the sum total of his attributes. It's his goodness. It's his power. When the Lord Jesus performed that first miracle in uh, Cana of Galilee, <clears throat> he turned the water into wine, and John says, and he manifested forth his glory, his power. We read in the New Testament several times, Paul talks about the glory of his grace. The glory of God includes his goodness. It includes his power. It includes his grace. The glory of God includes all that God is. And so when, when Moses says, show me your glory, I think he's saying, look, I, I want to see you. I've already seen you. I've already seen you on the mountain. I've already seen a display of the glory of God in the cloud that came down at the... Uh, at the, from Mount Sinai and, uh, and rested there at the tabernacle. I, I've seen something of the glory of God, but I want something more than that. Show me your glory. Show me who you are so that I might have a better appreciation of you. And whatever else happened that, on that occasion, it wasn't simply that Joseph, Moses, uh, Moses saw something, but he also heard something. The Lord says to him, I will cause my goodness to pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord. I will reveal to you who I am. And he gave him, I would suggest, an appreciation of who he was that he did not previously have. Well, we rejoice in hope of knowing more fully the glory of God. Whatever else will be involved throughout eternity, I would suggest that it will certainly involve this a fuller revelation, a fuller knowledge, and a fuller appreciation of the character and the nature of God. We rejoice in hope of knowing the glory of God more fully. 
<clears throat> but then thirdly, let me suggest that we might read it this way. We rejoice in hope of sharing the glory of God. We're going to be glorified. We're going to partake of something of the glory of God. Theologians, they talk about the incommunicable attributes of God. And these are uh, attributes of God which uh, we do not have and never will have. And so God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. Well, we are here and we will never will be everywhere at the same time. God is omniscient. God knows everything. Well, we don't know everything and we never will know everything. And so these are incommunicable attributes of God. They belong to him and to him alone. But there are other attributes of God which are communicable. In other words, we can, we can have those as well. God is love. Well, we can be love. God is good. We can be good. God is kind. We can be kind. God is wise. We can be wise. We're going to be glorified. We're going to be glorified. Something of the glory of God, something of what God is, is going to be imparted to us. I dare say it has physical implications. Paul says that in Philippians chapter 3, he will transform our lowly body to be more like his glorious body. That's the prospect we have. Maybe I'll have a few more inches in height and a little bit more hair and uh, <clears throat> fewer wrinkles. I mean, uh, we're going to be changed. We'll still be identifiable. I don't doubt it. People sometimes ask the question, will we know each other in heaven? Well, of course we will. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, says, I don't want you to mourn or you don't want you to sorrow as others who have no hope. Some of your loved ones have gone. Well, he said, they've gone to be with Jesus. And those also that have gone to be with Jesus and they sleep in Jesus, God will bring with him and we will be caught up together and we will meet them in the air. Comfort one, of your, comfort your, one another with these words. There's comfort because our loved ones will be there. We will know them. We'll be different, but we will be identifiable and we will remember each other's names. Isn't that something? I wouldn't just know, well, I know your face, but we will know who, 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 who we are and who the other people that we meet are. And so it's going to have uh, physical implications. Our bodies are going to be changed. But it goes more than that, doesn't it? It's, uh, our minds will be changed. No more occupied with self and sin. And our emotions will be changed. No more fear. No sorrow. No distress. And our characters will be changed. And Paul says in Romans chapter 8, we will be conformed to the image of his son. That's something that, uh, that thrills me, it boggles my mind. I'm going to be like Christ. It is something which is difficult to, to grasp, but it's something that is a glorious truth. J. N. Darby, he put it in, uh, in verse, and he says, And is it so I shall be like thy son? Is this the grace which he for me has won, Father of glory, thought beyond all thought, in glory to thine own blessed likeness brought? Nor I alone, thy loved ones all complete in glory. Round thee there with joy shall meet all like thee, for thy glory like thee, Lord, object supreme of all, by all adored. And we rejoice in hope of sharing something of the glory of God. Now, Mark, you, <clears throat> there is nothing uncertain about this. We rejoice in hope. When we use the word hope, well, there's always an element of doubt, isn't there? I hope. I hope it's going to happen, but I'm not sure. But, but this word hope in Scripture doesn't have any suggestion of doubt it might be translated assurance or certainty. We rejoice in certainty of the glory of God. We rejoice in assurance of the glory of God. It's bound to happen. Nothing can interfere with it. <clears throat> Again, I refer you to Romans chapter 8. And there in that wonderful passage, Paul says that whom he foreknew, he predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son and whom he predestinated, he called and whom he called, he justified. And whom he justified, he glorified. Now, isn't that interesting? He, he might have said, he will glorify. It hasn't happened yet. Whom he justified, he will glorify. 
It's still in the future, but no, no. Paul uses the past tense. It's already a fait accompli as far as God is concerned. Nothing can interfere with it. Everyone he foreknew is predestined. Everyone he predestined is called. Everyone he called is justified. Everyone he justified is glorified. And no one is lost in the process. It is a certainty. We're going to be like the Lord Jesus. John Piper, he puts it well, and I conclude with this. It's a little bit long, but I think it's worth reading. He says, I knelt to drink and knew that I was on the brink of endless joy, and everywhere I turned I saw a wonder there, a big man running on the lawn. That's old John Young with both legs on. The blind can see a bird on wing. The dumb can lift his voice and sing. The diabetic eats at will. The coronary runs uphill. The lame can walk. The deaf can hear. The cancer-ridden bone is clear. Arthritic joints are lithe and free, and every pain has ceased to be and every sorrow deep within, and every trace of lingering sin is gone, and all that's left is joy. And endless ages to employ the mind and heart to understand and love the sovereign Lord, who planned that it should take eternity to lavish all his grace on me, O God of wonder, God of might. Grant us some elevated sight of endless days, And let us see the joy of what is yet to be. And may your future make us free and guard us by the hope that we, within the light of candle four, are glorified, are glorified forevermore. And so, having been justified by faith, we have a new relationship. We have peace with God. We have a new standing. We have access into this grace in which we stand, and we have a new prospect. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. If you're a believer this morning, I hope that thrills your soul. That's what God has done for us. That is the result of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's through him. Nothing to do with us. Yeah, we trust in the Lord Jesus, but that's all we've done. It's all his doing. He's the one who died. He's the one who accomplished it, accomplishes it. He's the one who brings us into this place of favor before God. And we ought, we ought to respond in thanksgiving and praise for what he's done. But there may be that somebody here this morning and you don't, you don't, have, these, you don't have these blessings. Therefore, having been justified by faith. This is not for everybody. This is for those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus. And as a result result of that, they're declared righteous before God. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you've never trusted in the Lord Jesus. And if not, I would appeal to you this morning. I would point out, as I did last week, there's nothing you can do. There's no way you can merit favor with a holy God. And he is a holy God. And Paul has begun this letter by telling us the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. But he says in chapter 3, a righteousness of God is manifest. Even a righteousness of God is unto all and it's upon all those who believe. Father, we thank you for your word and for the opportunity to read it this morning and to think about these few verses. We thank you for the glorious truths that are here and pray that uh, they might encourage us. They might give us reason to rejoice and to be thankful uh, for all that you have done. We seek your blessing then as we conclude our time together and as we spend time remembering the Lord Jesus, we pray that our remembrance of him might be sweet, that it might be sincere, and that it might really bring glory and honor to him, we ask in his name. Amen.